This is the point at which it will all begin to come together. The session in which we will all breathe a collective, ah, now I understand everything. Golden threads will magically appear, silver bullets will fly through the air, and as we sit, Siddhartha-like, beneath the body tree of this wonderful roof, enlightenment will finally descend, or, or, or ascend, or, or whatever it is that enlightenment does. How would I know? I'm just a research director. It's been an immense pleasure to lead the Sustainable Lifestyles group over the last three and a half years, with more than a little help from my colleague Ian Christie, the unwavering support of our coordinator, Gemma Burkett, um, the continual and constructive, friendly criticism of our sponsors and the skillful cooperation of the various research teams who have already presented their work here today. What this is, this last overview, if you like, a little bit of a recap, a sort of a summary, and something towards a synthesis, but very much my take on um, what else SLRG has done and has talked about. As um, I mentioned at the beginning of the day, that's us sitting Siddhartha-like. Um, SLRG has a portfolio of projects which is around four main clusters. We talked about change processes, first of all. We talked about civil society and the role of community. We talked about uh, some economics issues, and then we have a couple of projects which are around synthesis. And synthesis is what I want to try to do a little bit of. Let me start by framing some of the work that we've done in terms of a couple of hypotheses, guiding assumptions, if you like, um, about sustainable living and about the transition that might get us there. There is a broad agreement in the literature that change is tough. Changing individual behaviors is difficult enough. Changing lifestyle practices across a whole range of domains borders on the heroic. And amongst the reasons for that difficulty is the profound role of habit, as we've already seen. Habitus in the more sociological form of Bourdieu in our lives. Habit often gets a bad rap. The term bad habit has an air of self-evident truth and potent decadence to it like the title of a Cameron Diaz movie. In fact, a more nuanced view would have us understand that our ability to semi-automatize whole realms of our behavior, like shopping and cooking and cleaning and paying electricity bills and doing emails and getting to work on time, offers evolutionary advantages to the human species. Habit frees up precious intellectual resources for more interesting pursuits, like writing academic papers watching bad movies, and worrying about unsustainable practices. The trouble is that many of the practices that slip beneath the cognitive radar are the very same ones whose unsustainability we worry about in our less automatic moments. And from this paradox emerges the realization that what needs to happen in order to get from the unsustainable present to the sustainable future is the ability to break those habits. The breaking of bad habits has become a kind of holy grail for sustainability research. It isn't, in fact, a new discussion. In fact, the problem of breaking bad habits is as old as the hills, and one that has occupied social psychologists in particular since at least the writing of Kurt Lewin in the early 20th century. Lewin's field theory posits that habitual behaviors are essentially socialized behaviors inherently framed through the individual's relationship to their social environment. Lewin's theory of change involved two distinct hypotheses. The first was that the process of change requires us to unfreeze habitual behaviors, a disruptive process that can sometimes leave us temporarily disoriented, discomforted even. Unpleasant though it may sometimes feel, Lewin regarded this discomfort as a critical part of the process of directive change. It's the disorientation that interferes with cognitive override and allows attention back into the process. Because our behaviors are inherently socialized, this process of unfreezing habits should also be a social one in Lewin's view. And this was his second hypothesis, that change is best negotiated 
in social groups. Kurt Lewin's ideas about change processes have had an enormous empirical impact, informing, amongst other things, the work of Alcoholics Anonymous, Waste Watchers, and Global Action Plan's Action at Home program. His hypotheses have been adapted and generalized in various ways over the years. And a part of our work in SLRG was to test two specific versions of these basic hypotheses. First, we explored the idea that there are certain moments of transition in people's lives, moving house, for example, having a child for the first time, or retiring, at which habits become forcibly disrupted. We wanted to test the hypothesis that this window of disruption could provide opportunities for new, more sustainable behaviors to take the place of those that had gone before. If we could identify those places and times we wondered, might it then be possible to build sustainability initiatives specifically targeted at people undergoing those changes? And would these initiatives, in these circumstances, stand a higher chance of success? Basfer Planken and Debbie Roy's Habit Project was a large-scale control trial initially involving 800 households, some of whom had recently moved house and some of whom had not moved house at all recently. A subsample from each category was exposed to an intervention, a package of self-help to enable people to live more sustainably, designed by our project partners, the Peterborough Environment City Trust. And all the categories were tested twice to see how a set of 25 reported behaviors changed over an eight-week period. It was the single largest and most comprehensive study of its kind, aimed at testing the habit discontinuity hypothesis. It was a bit like sieving for gold. What we found, remarkably, was a tiny nugget, a tentative confirmation of our hypothesis. There does indeed appear to be a narrow window of opportunity around about three months in this study following a house move when people are more susceptible to interventions aimed at helping them to live more sustainably. But the study also showed that this window closes rather quickly. By six months, it's gone. We also found that throughout the disruption caused by moving house, which is up there with divorce and bereavement in terms of stress, we're told, there are so many factors vying for people's attention that this effect size is rather small. Not the least of those factors, of course, is people's obvious desire to shrug off the disorientation of transition and get back to something that might reasonably be called normal life. And when normality is defined all around them by unsustainable practices and unforgiving infrastructures, it's hardly surprising that this narrow window closes so quickly. The Illicit Project, led by Kate Burningham and Sue Venn, was a more qualitative approach, exploring people's experiences through times of change. In this case, the changes associated with becoming a parent for the first time on the one hand and retiring on the other. We talked in depth to around 40 new parents, mostly new mothers, and around 40 retirees, both before and after these life-changing transitions. And what we found was surprising. The transitions are not so much moments of change as extended periods of more and less disruption. That people often cope not just with one transition, but with several transitions at the same time. As income changes, so do relationships. As health changes, so do aspirations. And throughout these periods of multiple disruption, we witness persistent attempts to renegotiate some form of continuity in our lives. Continuity of provisioning, the need to keep the household going. Continuity of aspirations, not just for ourselves, but also for those we love and care about. A continual struggle to achieve these goals in the face of changing resources, sometimes with less time, sometimes with more time, sometimes with less money, sometimes with more. And our respondents reveal how life course transitions are not so much discrete transitions at all, but rather a continuous process of negotiation between change and continuity. And perhaps not surprisingly, this process of negotiation occurs continually, not just in the obvious moments of transition, 
but throughout our lives. And we began to see, too, how processes of change and resistance to change interact with one another. As change presents itself, disrupting our habitual practices, we find ourselves striving to renegotiate continuity in order to return ourselves to some kind of comfort zone. And it's important to recognize, I think, that what's at stake here is not just our ability to provision for ourselves efficiently, but our opportunities to devote cognitive resources to what really matters to us as human beings. Our new role as parents, our quest for identity as senior citizens, our new relationships with our neighbors and friends, our continuing aspirations for the good life, however we may frame it, the social and psychological functions of identity and meaning that make life worth living are dependent on our ability to relegate, or perhaps to elevate, much of day-to-day -day existence to the level of habit. What we've stumbled on here, I think, is another take on the inherent tension that Andy Sterling so usefully drew our attention to this morning between sustainability on the one hand and transformation on the other. As some of our respondents told us outright, sustainability, in their view, is about our, their ability to keep everything going, to live within their means, to protect and preserve their aspirations for the good life, wherever that may lead us. Life doesn't sit there and wait for the conditions to improve. Sustainable or not, here I come. And yet, our long-term ability to sustain what Andy called the functions of living well demands fundamental transformations in the structures of living well. Disruptions to the continuity of our lives may offer latent opportunities to change our values, our attitudes, and our lifestyles. But if we end up working against the infrastructures of provision, then our own highest priorities and our inherent need for cognitive efficiency will lead us straight back to unsustainability. Sometimes this desire for cognitive and physical efficiency can work in favor of sustainability. As one of our respondents told us in the illicit study, we recycle because we have no choice. The infrastructure is there to support us, to guide us, even to force us into a new habitual practice. And once the cognitive effort required begins to subside, we scarcely even notice that we're being environmental at all. In other cases, of course, it isn't anything like so simple. We have to take a car, we were told, by one of our retirees, because there is no bus. And as for those of us foolhardly enough to flaunt the car-based society altogether and take to our bikes, I'm reminded of a staggering piece of structural dis disdain to be found as a picturesque cycle path in northwest Surrey ends in a three-lane roundabout. Cyclists dismount. The intrepid cyclist is warned peremptorily. Dismount and then what, you wonder, as the traffic roars by. Since there are no further pavements, paths or tracks beyond the sign, dismount and die, perhaps. <laughs> Breaking bad habits is possible, but it isn't enough. Transformation of lifestyles is only really possible in the context of a transformation of structures. The good life of the good person is only really possible in the context of the good society, as Zia Sardar once wrote in an essay that I commissioned for the Sustainable Development Commission. The question that we're then faced with in the light of this understanding is who exactly is to take responsibility for those transformations in structure? Households routinely slide back into routine. Businesses are reluctant to invest without clear signals from government, and government has always been coy about intervening in what it perceives to be lifestyle choice. In fact, as Ian Christie and Julie Barnett's examination of policy reveals, policymaking in the context of sustainable living is fraught with a kind of anxiety. In the context of multivalent practices within complex causal networks, the policymakers' search for a silver bullet is not just unrewarding, it's counterproductive. The golden thread leading inexorably from indisputable evidence to incontrovertible policy is a chimera. And the best intentions for an orderly regression of long-run policy 
continually finds itself disrupted by political priorities. Events, dear boy, events. As Harold Macmillan once replied when asked what he most feared as prime minister. And as some of our respondents in the policy study suggested, the big picture framing of the 2010s isn't sustainability anymore at all, but how to recover from 2008. Way back, back in 2006, the prime minister before last once said, making the shift to sustainable lifestyles is one of the most important challenges of the 21st century. A welcome declaration for those already convinced of the need to understand what sustainability might mean and one which no, played no small part in establishing our work. How things have changed in the intervening years. I'd like to note at this point that I've put the word David Cameron in quotation marks, as he hasn't either confirmed or denied that he said the thing above it. Making the shift is the most important challenge of the 21st century. Both the illicit project and the habit project identified a vital role for intermediaries. Civil society organizations capable of providing targeted support during times of transition. A key factor in the limited success that the habit project identified was the role played by the Peterborough Environment City Trust, a community-based organization working to support and facilitate change. This role was actually a far from insignificant one, acting not only to provide information and to motivate change, but to offer hands-on advice throughout the process of change itself. The importance of this factor in the limited support for the habit discontinuity hypothesis raises an interesting general question about the role of civil society in processes of transition. If households themselves are not obvious candidates for the transformation of social structures, can civil society provide some of that force? Can community-based change provide some kind of foundation for the transition to sustainability? The assumption that it can was the second of the two key hypotheses that we set out to test in SLRG. Again, the pedigree of such a hypothesis is surprisingly long. In fact, it's a variation on the same hypothesis that Lewin placed at the heart of his theory of change. The unfreezing of habits is best undertaken in social groups. The idea that community governance of common pool resources could be more successful than top-down policy or market incentives won Eleanor Ostrom a somewhat belated Nobel Prize in economics. Gardner and Stern called community-based change the forgotten strategy in encouraging pro-environmental behaviors. So our aim to test this hypothesis was at least a reasonable one. Three different projects in our portfolio undertook this task. Two of these chose to explore the role of civil society in food systems, perhaps the most basic structure of provisioning in our lives. Bex White's study of resilience amongst local food producers in Brighton paints a fascinating picture of fragile sometimes unstructured initiatives, struggling to make progress in the face of insecure funding, overbearing administrative demands, and misconceptions about the role of local food production itself, rather than being seen as an integral component in the building of local communities, or indeed as part of the transformation of wider food systems, local food producers often find themselves cast in the role of filling the gaps left by the private and the public sector and called to account against simplistic accounting criteria. Their principal struggle, in fact, is for resilience, the ability to sustain themselves. In the face of harsh external conditions, their best hopes for survival lie in a supportive local council, I suppose a green MP or two doesn't hurt either, and a strong, well-funded intermediary, in this case, the Brighton and Hove Food Partnership. Like the Peterborough Environment City Trust, the Food Partnership played a vital role in addressing the barriers to transition, reducing some of the day-to-day -day demands of survival and allowing local groups to focus on growing food. Rachel Durrant's study 
explored the wider role that civil society organizations can play potentially in transition. Following three different kinds of organizations, ostensibly working at different levels of social intervention, she found them inevitably playing multiple roles in pursuit of transition, from grassroots innovation to niche development, contesting the normative basis of the food system itself and simultaneously striving to reform the incumbent regime. There was clear evidence here that successful civil society organizations are adaptive and dynamic, playing different roles at different times in pursuit of system transformation. The challenge for policy, Rachel argued, is to resist trying to control the outcomes and instead enable the inherent dynamism to flourish. Some of these themes recurred in Emily Creamer's research on sustainable living in remote rural Scotland. The Climate, Change, the Climate Challenge Fund is a Scottish government program which provides funding for community groups to tackle climate change. Grants are designed to support community-led projects that reduce local carbon emissions, make community improvements, and help communities cope with the impacts of climate change. But grant funding of this kind, Emily found, is a double-edged sword, sometimes serving to disrupt community even as it seeks to attain its sustainability goals. Like Rachel and like Bex, Emily highlighted the need for a more nuanced policy, supporting the role of community not just as a means to a narrowly prescribed end, but as an end in itself, as a part of what sustainability means. All of these findings are important. They offer policy new ways of interacting with civil society and engaging with households and communities in transition. Some of these initiatives we've looked at may turn out to be genuinely transformative, overthrowing the unsustainability of incumbent practices and replacing them with new regimes. But do we have enough to go on here? Can we reliably say that between these two hypotheses, we've identified the key to sustainable living? And the answer is patently no for all sorts of reasons. Most of these initiatives are small. Most of them struggle for survival. Organizations like households are torn, as Andy reminded us, between the need to sustain function and the need to transform structure. Being successful in one is no immediate recipe for success in the other. Perhaps most crucially of all, individual success is no recipe for success at the systems level. Each individual act of sustainability contributes something to change. But the sum of all those changes doesn't always add up to what we want it to or expect it to. Amongst the most powerful of the stories we've explored in our research is the one associated with the rebound effect. It's an acknowledged truth that many of the actions individual households and communities take in pursuit of sustainability are also economically efficient. They save us money. And by using economic resources more efficiently or not using them ourselves, not using them at all, the money that we save is then spent on other goods and services. And as Steve Sorrell showed this morning, where we put those savings matters. Rebound is the energy of carbon associated with our respending of those economic savings. In many cases, the effect isn't huge, but it's often significant. Around a third of the savings from sufficiency measures are lost to rebound, for example. And in some cases, the impacts of our respending can more than wipe out the benefits of our actions in the first place. The most striking thing about the rebound story, it seems to me, is that like so much else that we've talked about today, the success or failure of our best intentions depends heavily on the structures around us. In a society, for example, in which we allow free reign to turn lights into flights, the potential for failure is enormous. Under different conditions, in an economy perhaps not so reliant for its stability on relentless consumption growth, the respending effect of our efficiency savings redirected to investment in clean technology, for example, could even induce positive returns to scale, negative rebound, more than we had hoped for in the first place, something which Ian 
has aptly christened as, as income capture and storage, putting our money into a savings vehicle that invests in the new economy in transition to the future offers us negative rebound. Which of these situations transpires depends ultimately on the framework that governments place around finance, around investment, around the market, around community, around consumerism itself, around the institutions and structures within which our lives are negotiated. And the space for policy action, far from being vanishingly small, is potentially enormous once we take these wider perspectives on system change. I want to stop at this point. There's much that I haven't co covered and much that we've had to gloss over during the day. I'm sure we can tease some at least of that out in discussion shortly. And I want to finish just by mentioning actually one of our smallest projects that hasn't been mentioned before. And it resonates very strongly with something that um, Helga was talking about earlier in the, in, the, in the afternoon. From our earliest discussions, we wanted a project that would look at children and sustainability. We had in mind initially the idea of a longitudinal study following a particular cohort of children, or perhaps successive cohorts over time, a bit like Granada's famous 7-Up series, which followed a cohort of children born in 1956 and reported on their progress every seven years. What might such a study look like, we wondered, if it were motivated as much by sustainability as by lifestyle? How would our children begin to negotiate the changes that must inevitably take place over the next few decades? It was immediately clear that we wouldn't have the resources for such a study ourselves, however valuable it was in understanding the potential to live sustainably. So instead, we allocated a small amount of money, I think it was around about 0.3% of our overall budget, towards a tiny scoping study, aiming to establish the viability of such a project in the future. And as our thinking on this idea progressed, we began to work closely with two different partners on related project ideas. With UNEP, we have in fact now built the groundwork for Cycles, a collaborative international survey aiming to understand how children and youth negotiate their relationship to sustainability in cities. We're now in a six month planning phase of that project with UNEP and a number of other collaborators from around the world. At the same time, inspired by the idea of the Granada documentary, we began to work closely with a documentary producer Amanda Blue, who's renowned for her work with children, on the possibility of a long-form documentary that would capture some of these challenges. They never had it so good, it's a Harold Macmillan quote again, um, was, uh, a, is now in the form of a proposal that um, Amanda Blue and Tantrum Films are putting together around this um, area. And I suppose our hope is, in this project, a tiny part of the resources of SLRG will actually be a way in which the ideas that we've drawn together here can live on well beyond uh, the life of SLRG itself. In fact, um, the long-form documentary that we're envisaging it's a 20-year project, um, revisiting cities every five years, uh, exactly as we had originally envisaged in our proposal for this project. Taken together, I think these two projects are, um, I hope, a part of the legacy that SLRG has brought, both to policy and indeed to society. I want to just end by showing you a, a short um, provocation in relation to this film with many thanks to um, Tantrum Films who put some slides together and our communications guru Linda Gessner who worked um, most of yesterday to turn them into a little video and before we go into the panel session and as a kind of end to my synthesis of SLRG and 
a taster for future work, I want to just show you this little video now. Okay, um, I'm not sure how much of that was visible from the back, but the, the broad idea of um, a long-form documentary, I think, is a very, very exciting one. We're pleased to be working with um, Amanda and Tantrum um, on that. What I'd like to do now is certainly to open the floor for questions, but to call um, our panel onto the stage and for us to have the last half to three quarters of an hour of this afternoon um, in discussion. And uh, the idea really is to get some feedback from the panel, to provoke from the panel, to have some more uh, questions from the floor, to have a discussion about the future, and of course, to probe any of the ideas that you've um, had today. So maybe, perhaps I could just ask Mike, Helga, um, Graham, and Lee to come up, thanks. Right, so um, what I think I would like to do is, is very quickly to ask you, each of you, to, to give reflections. Now, Mike hasn't been here for the whole day, so it's a little unfair, um, but he has been here for a little while, and he is, in fact, on the advisory board of um, our group, so he knows a little bit about our work. And um, I think rather than, rather than sort of um, giving a, a big presentation of ideas at this point, it would be good just to have a couple of quick reflections and some provocations, and then we'll, we'll see where that discussion goes. Um, Graham, perhaps I could start with you. Okay. Um, so I'm from the uh, Centre for the Study of Democracy, and I'm also a trustee of the Foundation for Democracy and Sustainable Development. And I say that not just to advertise those two institutions, but actually to stress this word democracy which hasn't really been talked about much here. And this, I think, links to my earlier, earlier point about um, habits of institutions and about changing at the institutional level. A lot of what we focused on has been changing at the individual level and the role that particularly, particular civil society groups or civil society in general might play. But we have actually not talked much about those larger institutions and how we legitimise change in those institutions. So I guess... For me, this is an area where actually the funders have been quite poor in actually looking at the kind of, for me, this kind of structural level, how we actually legitimise change in systems of provision if household change and just leaving things to civil society in itself isn't enough. Right. And any thoughts on, on, from your side on, on how that transition in systems of provision is legitimised? I mean, are you calling there, is it a political call for government? Um, well, obviously, first of all, it's a call for research, and primarily a call for research from my research centre. But that's. Um, <laughs> but um, I think the the issue here is at the moment. I, I, my concern, uh, and it's a research question and it's a practical question, is whether we actually have the institutions that we need for the tra for that transition. I'm thinking here in particular about, from, from my own background, about the democratic institutions and given the degree of mistrust of politics and our politicians and by politicians of the people we have a really enormous disjuncture but I don't think there's a necessary I don't think democracy is necessarily myopic I don't think it is necessarily short term it necessarily will always drive economic growth um, or be driven by economic growth whichever way we want to think about it but I think we really need to spend much more time focusing on that question of institutional redesign, if you like, and thinking about okay. how, how we can really make some sort of entry point there. Yeah. Lee, perhaps I could come to you on that one, because, it, I mean, we, uh, the assumption, really, the premise behind working as SLRG and working with government directly on policy-related research is that that will translate into the kinds of changes that we're talking about. What are the limits of that model? Um. I think that the, that the most obvious limit that, uh, that has sort of come out through all of the presentations today is that actually, you know, there's no point 
for one particular, there's no point in one particular actor attempting to uh, achieve change, but actually the drivers for transformations are at all different levels. The key is that, uh, that, that we don't just therefore carry on doing exactly what we've always been doing, which is really difficult and is a big challenge for policy, I think. Um, I mean, stop me if I'm going well beyond your question, but I think one of the key values of the experience that I've had and, you know, I think uh, other policy colleagues that I work with here has been that it, it really has promoted those, those questions about actually what are we doing, well, what are the, what's the, it, it's challenged us to think about why we don't always uh, feel comfortable uh, in terms of uh, prioritizing activities or facilitating activities that we don't know what the answer is going to be or we don't think we know what the answer is going to be at the end and you know some of the some of the presentations that we'll probably get on to discussing some of the outputs have really emphasized that that need to expect you know get that sort of exposure and, and accept the fact that sometimes we don't know what the tran the right transition is or who's going to be the actors that sort of make that happen but actually, if you're having the discussions, you're probably doing a lot of, a lot of the, the work needed to foster that kind of context. Thanks, Lee. Um, one of the voices that to some extent has been, and it was pointed out earlier, has been missing from our, from our work um, has been uh, the voice of business and, and the role of business models in particular. Mike, I mean, that's your direct experience. It's where you come into this enormous wealth of experience in creating uh, different business models. Yeah, th this is something that I grapple with every day of my life at, at work. And first, I'd just like to say thank you. Because I think three years ago when this project started, the level of evidence base that we had to understand the consumer and how we can lead them on a journey to more pragmatic, sustainable change was, was virtually none. You filled that to a considerable extent. So thank you for that. Three very quick observations. Firstly, I will push, and I will push us all, myself and you, that we must put the consumer and the citizen at the heart of this in terms of what is the benefit to them. I still find a slight framing of the debate here as they're wrong, they need, we need to find ways of lecturing them or telling them to improve. If you look at the great success in our space at the moment, it's the emergence of the new sharing collaborative economy, the Airbnbs, the Kivas, the Kickstarters, the Zipcars, the reason these guys are going so well is they put the consumer right at the heart of it. It's better for you, it's faster, it's cheaper, it's more accessible, it's more aspirational to be involved with. People latching onto it, not because there's a life cycle assessment saying it's dramatically 40% less social environmental impact, it is better for the consumer first. We must force ourselves to think through that lens. The second thing I've taken from this is there will always be a limitation to how much the consumer individually can do. The rebound discussion today was fantastic, fascinating. But we're now going to ask the consumer to say, save some energy, then pause and think about how you're going to distribute that saving wisely. It's too much for people. At macro level, it is for business and for government to organise themselves better to say how can we prompt and support people to change. So I think at the moment there's very fragmented efforts and activity going on out there between government departments, between businesses, UK and international. And I think there's a need for a little bit more co coordination needed. I can see it happening in places like World Economic Forum, the Consumer Goods Forum, that, that's where I sit, but we need more of it. And my third and final point is there has to be space here for the grassroots entrepreneurship that we've been hearing about. To try and design everything from on high is wrong. It's wrong and the, it will fail. We have to create the space and the enablers where people can co-create, whether it's in the Highlands of Scotland or down on the south coast in Brighton, they can find the solutions that we don't need our public pause on. So this has been a fantastic piece of work and they're just three takeouts I'll take from it. Just to push you a little bit further, Mike, on that, on that, you know, that, that was a call almost to say it's business and government that really have to work in collaboration here. What, what would that look like? In what form would that happen? So I think the next step on for this research, you've done the basics now to understand the consumption systems and what drive it, how we can start to work with people generally. I think we need to be a little bit more specific now. We need to look in more detail at the food system, the clothing system, the mobile phone system, the airline system the things that drive people into those particular consumption habits and, and systems. And we had a really good debate um, at, at, at the table with Jonathan a little bit earlier about, well, surely this is business just asking government to sort it all out, to pay for it, to legislate for it. No. I think collectively we need to take a helicopter view of the systems that, which drive consumption for us and say, okay, there are 10 things that we could fundamentally change to make those systems more sustainable. 
There are two things that government needs to do to unlock the potential of business and others to do eight other things. And I want government to focus on the one or two things that will really shift the dial. In some cases, it might be the right taxation system, an information system in another, a voluntary agreement with business in another one. It's going to be different things for different consumption-based systems. But we need to now start to probe what are the specific levers that government pull, few in number, and what are the number that I as a businessman will pull, in part to drive our business forward. And there will be many more than government, but government has to help us unlock that potential. Okay, I, I, I think that one of the things that, to me, was really interesting about bringing Helga into the debate was, well, partly that it was a project that we weren't able to cover, but also that it, in some ways it's potentially deeply subversive, what you're saying. <laughs> and, and actually my question, when Bass was asking the question, well, why, you know, why does materialism make us unhappy? My question was, why do we consume if it makes us unhappy? Why do we continue to be materialistic if it's actually making us unhappy? And, and it, it is you know, clear in some sense that one of the reasons for that is because actually we need your little primary children, I'm sorry, not to be resisting the lure of consumerism, but actually to be as materialistic as they possibly can because that's what keeps the economy going. Um, where, where do you see the challenge for government in, in the kind of findings, very powerful findings that you presented? Okay, I can offer a few observations. I'll just throw a few things in the ring. One has to do with if we're looking at actually empowering and enabling people to be more mindful and critical consumers and more sustainable consumers, it has to be affordable for them. And I talked to somebody in India a little while ago about a particular project they're running there, which is actually using making products out of recycled materials, but making sure they're cheap enough. I, don't, I assume they're subsidized. So the poorest strata, in particular Indian society, can actually afford to buy them because it struck me with some of the comments about organic foods and issues around um, even public transport, there is a real issue of some people actually not even being able to afford that. So that's just something thrown in the ring. He's a bit disjointed. I hope this is kind of okay. Another one has to do with the notion of I don't know whether you've, any of you have heard of this, emotionally durable design. Does that mean to, to mm. yeah. I mean, it seems to me there is a kind of a bringing together of actually saying, let's try and not produce for inbuilt obsolescence, but actually have products which endure for longer, which would certainly help sustainability. But actually combine that with persuading people to also make them emotionally durable, that there is a value in looking after things, repairing it, taking care of it, with a sort of maybe special investment that you would show a pet or somebody, something else you really cared for. There's something here, and I'm afraid there is a sort of a sense in which I think there is a tension between, you know, if I can just put it very bluntly, if I can make you all feel really bad about yourself and really insecure about the way you look and the way you dress and so on, I'm going to sell you more products because you'll be in a corner where you think, I have to fix it, I have to fix it. And that is not all, but that is a part of what is happening. How we deal with that, the fact that there is a profit motive at play is something that's very difficult to integrate into the whole equation of how we can create changes that produce a consumer world we can, if you like, beneficially make use of. I don't have any answers, but there is an issue and a tension, and yeah. I have no idea yeah. what, yeah. Yeah, so Mike, I mean, plan A is a fantastic strategy for sustainability in Marks and Spencer's. To what extent could it actually cope with that kind of model, where, where essentially what we're saying is, know, do not buy this jacket, to, to, to steal the catchphrase of Patagonia. Um, <laughs> to what extent do you, you must struggle with that in your, in your strategic work in, in Marks and Spencers? To what ex how far does that model go in, in towards the kind of thing that, that um, Helga's talking about? I mean, Helga is, is the right challenge, and I say that as a businessman that works for a model that's entirely driven by consumption today. We, we seek to sell more. I mean, that, that's our, our, our growth model. That's what we seek to tap into in terms of cool. global demand. 
Now, we think there's a better way of doing it. I mean, our aim at the moment is to make the existing business model have less of a footprint. So the individual products I sell you today have less of a footprint than five years ago. But there are more of them. Mm -hmm. And there'll be more of them in the future. That was, that, that's what defines success for us at the moment. Now, my challenge, I sort of, that's, that's the sort of mere culpa. That's the hand up to say, we have to change. My response to practical businessmen, though, that need to lead uh, a business on the journey to change is, it's a journey. If I suddenly walk into the boardroom now and say, you know what, guys, we're going to sell less next year, and we're going to aim to sell less. You know, <laughs> I ain't there anymore. I'm not <laughs> aiming anymore. Yes. But we have, we have a 10 to 15 year plan that says we are on the trajectory into a world driven by a sharing economy, a collaborative economy. We're just flogging people the volume of stuff has to change. Now, the point at which your clothing model becomes a circular one, you rent clothing, you hire it out, your food, become, food business becomes a well-being based business, utterly driven by the, the well-being of the consumer. Is that five years out, 10 years out, 15 years out? I can't predict at this moment mm -hmm. in time. But I'm very clear that one of the reasons that we're doing plan A is to create the capacity and the flexibility and the skills and the partnerships within the organization to be able to contemplate that in the future. Mm -hmm. But we have to take our own organization, our supply chain, and our customers on that journey. And I'll just use one final little anecdote mm -hmm. there. If I walked into, got one of our core customers to walk into our Wigan store today and say, you know what, Mavis, I'm gonna rent you a piece of clothing. It's more sustainable, love. She'd walk right next door to Primark because it seems bizarre, utterly different from the way she lives her life today. We have to take people on the journey to that end point that Helga set us. Is it a discussion that you can, at this point, have inside M&S? Yes, but only in the most, in the broadest sense. So we're not having a detailed discussion at the moment to say, how do we shift literally from flogging 350 million items a year to selling the same equivalent value in terms of return to us, in terms of service to our consumer? Mm -hmm. Now, that's at the boardroom level. Within the skunk works of the business, which I represent to a degree, that thing is happening. We've just launched a big, big project with the technology strategy board within the business to think about new consumption models. So it's happening there, but not there yet. Okay, let's suppose, and we're just a little blue sky thinking here, that, mm -hmm. that you and M&S and many other businesses are all prepared to have this conversation, and that Helga brings to the table her model of how materialism is actually destroying well-being and undermining the, the, the future of our children. Lee, is there a place in government that can listen mm -hmm. to that conversation? Well, I would say that we are already. <laughs> um, I mean, what you, you're talking to, uh, to, to somebody who op uh, operates in a particular policy area within government. I mean, and I, I guess this is going to sound very weasley and whiny, so I'm preparing you. But I mean, I think that you know we've heard a lot about you know the diversity of different sectors, the diversity of business, the diversity of the civil society, and I think that that's completely right. I think you've got to recognise that there, that government is not a you know a complete single you know you, you can't switch we're all working to slightly different objectives and things like that so with that caveat my what I'm saying is that I'm talking about my work with Jonathan's team and people like that on things like resource efficiency and sustainable product policy uh, food waste which I'm alarmed to hear you know has got a terrible rebound effect and things like that but uh, I mean, we are incredibly interested in concepts around things like the, uh, the circular economy, models that you know, Mike is referring to around product service systems, uh, how you could make a transition from a situation, and what the benefits would be of making, because it isn't completely clear to us, of making a transition from a situation where, for example, you buy a material product to where you purchase the utility of that product. So one of our projects, one of our action research projects at the moment is looking at a model and uh, a model of where you could rent baby equipment rather than purchasing baby equipment. And there's a clear logic behind that because, you know, your needs change quickly, there's a transition point and things like that. Mm -hmm. We don't know. I mean, then when you look at where it's happening, so for example, the, the, the example of, you know, the top end of product service system that we always talk about is uh, the transition that's gone from you know buying CDs to purchasing downloads, complete dematerialization. Although I don't know what the impact of all those servers are that are storing all of our music and things like that now. But let's just say, from a material policy pers perspective, that seems like quite a good transition. It seems to us that you know I, I would say, although you know this is one person speaking here, but it seems to me that 
if you're talking about uh, a positive transition that leads to, you know, we continue to consume, we continue to get benefits, that sort of transition away from owning something to valuing the utility and the benefits you get feels to me like a positive sort of transition. And it works across a number, you know, it's, it's something that we're sort of testing out. Well, how does that work for business and what are the barriers for business? Because there are some magna magnificent barriers to business who are shaped and that service provision is shaped on a particular way of consuming. You know, if you look at um, the question, I guess, of, you know, we now get our books, uh, a lot of our books through downloads. Why was it Amazon who was able to make that transition but not necessarily Waterstones? You know, they had a very, you know, they had a, a hold on the market. What was, you know, what were the physical infrastructure barriers that prevent people from from uh, seizing those opportunities and making those transitions? And I mean, I think that's why actually some of the discussions we've had today, you know, Beck's presentation, Rachel's presentation on actually how do these transitions take place? And they take a disruption that we don't control and they also take a hell of a lot of, you know, uh, innovation happening uh, to, to make the right thing happen at the right time. And I think that we are, from a policy perspective, certainly in, in my area of DEFRA, well, Jonathan's area of DEFRA, I shouldn't, you know, um, <laughs> we are really open to that. But it is challenging and it is, you know, a difficult thing because actually when someone comes to us at the end of the spending review period and says, and what have you achieved for this, you know, it's sometimes quite difficult to point to, and this is what we've, we've achieved. Graeme, you seem to be making a, a kind of, yeah. you know, a bigger claim when in your first intervention. Yeah, I, but, I, but I also just want to respond to this. I mean, it's really noticeable to me, and again, you know, this is no criticism of this research project or the people in this room. It is only DEFRA in this room, and only a small bit of DEFRA. And I think this is a real challenge for us, both as a research community, and I'm sure it's a true for businesses, about how you actually, you know, the, the, the move government, because as you say, government isn't a single entity, and there are so many different parts of government working at, uh, or with different agendas and different, and, I mean, DEFRA itself, you're only one small part of that. I, I find, I mean, I, I love the way you were talking about sort of in a, the sort of innovation that's often happening and the sort of uh, capacity building within business, and I worry that that's not so much happening in some of our public institutions to the same, to the same degree. There's not that degree of innovation because the nature of the uh, the nature of the of the beast in a sense, and I think that's really I think there's some really interesting pockets of work going on. Mm. But it's how you bring that together. I just want to just reiterate a comment that was made uh, by Ian, where he actually talked about what we most of us are doing is actually a go in a ghost area of policy. That was a that was some a comment by one of the policymakers, and that that is really crucial at the moment. That how we make these interventions even when things were looking rosy for sustainability, was, in, was incredibly difficult. How you make those interventions now when people don't want to talk about sustainability is really, uh, and, uh, unless it's called economic sustainability, I think is really is really fundamental question. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't you okay. know. Okay. So I uh, seem to be yeah, No, no, I mean, <laughs> I think, I think it, is, it is obviously one of the things that's happened. I mean, I mean, I don't think we necessarily have to take it as read that it's always going to be like that. Oh, no, no, goes, no. You know, maybe the ghost will return and actually in some substance within the space of quite a short space of time. Who knows? Well, ghosts um, haunt, don't they? They so haunt. Ghosts haunt. They, they haunt. <laughs> and the values, actually, one of the discussions that was very interesting that we didn't quite have this morning, but was raised by a number of people, the question of, of values and, and the need to change values. Um, Helga, very, very quickly, because you were basically making a case that values don't change. And yet, to some extent, the point that Andy was bringing in about how culture changes and how it shifts quite rapidly sometimes is an implicit value change, uh, at least in, in, in the sense of kind of emergent values in the way that people behave in the society. How strongly do you stick to the idea that it's not really about value change? Um, I think I put the idea about talking to children as, if you like, I might have phrased it too strongly, I just think that value change is maybe harder to achieve once you're an adulthood and once you've got a whole number of constraints. But I also want to, in a way, make a point which is related to that, that in terms of approaching material goods or um, 
I, I want to avoid the word materialism for, for a minute. There's a lot of research to show that having material goods and using them in particular ways is identity sustaining, identity expressive, it's good for your identity, gives you a sense of personal history, gives you a sense of well-being. There's also ways of approaching and relating to material goods which really undermines well-being, as I talked about earlier. And I think it's very important to distinguish between these identity affirming and identity undermining <coughs> trajectories and to link that in. So to actually say it's a very specific type of materialism, it's a very specific type of, of, of if you like, that really is causing the problem. That's very important to make this qualification, I think. And it does relate also to what values do we actually want to change. I think we have to be very, very specific. Speaking as a psychologist, if you want to use material goods to repair things like personal relationships, low self-esteem, depression, anxiety, a whole series of other things, you are really on the road to ruin. I mean, to put it really bluntly, but there are ways in which we can usefully, collectively use material goods, not to excess in a kind of more mindful, maybe, way, to, to greater effect. I mean, that's, if you like, a roundabout way of saying, let's, let's be very, very careful about what we are asking for. And I think the idea that there are good ways of dealing with consumer culture is also one, I think, where we can talk with businesses more easily. It's not a kind of a blanket, let's kind of, you know, step out and do the sort of hippie drippy thing of getting out of the system. I don't think that's where it's at at all. Okay, le let's open the conversation up. I mean, there's been some fantastic conversations um, earlier in the day. <coughs> You've heard a lot of different presentations, some of it challenging, some of it methodologically interesting, some of it um, politically challenging. Um, what, are, what are the issues that you'd like to address either to the panel or to anything that you've heard in the present presentations today? What are the, what are the burning questions that you feel having listened to the work that we've done over three and a half years, listened to some of policy's response to that work um, that are still outstanding? And, and I would uh, invite anybody really, uh, including the people who are um, in SLRG to intervene at, at this point. I can see some hands already going up. Um, if you could wait, wait for the microphone briefly. Um, Sue, Andy, I have first on the list, and then Alma at the back there, Gemma. Thanks. We'll take, we'll take um, two or three questions, and then we'll come back to some responses from the panel. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm not sure it counts as a burning question, but it is something I found really fascinating in the discussion today. And, and the best way to hinge it is on something very interesting Helga said in a really excellent talk, which was a, a, a kind of side remark about, I think as I recall it, some kind of pattern, ordering, correlation of spending on advertising and marketing on a national basis and some of the materialism measures you were using. And I, I wanted to hinge on that because we tend to assume whether it's at the psychological level, the social level, the institutional level, that the things we regard as needing transformation are somehow hardwired. And we spend a lot of time thinking about the Im immense amount, in a very disempowering way, of effort it takes to transform from them. And there's a danger sometimes we don't look at the incredible amount of activity going on at the same time, keeping them in place, because they're not actually hardwired. So a good candidate for that here is the advertising marketing infrastructures, which I think are stupendously large in resource allocation terms, which are being maintained very visibly all the time. So I wondered, I don't, I'm simply ignorant on this, I, I wonder, Helga, given your remark on that, whether there is work more deeply than, than, than that that actually looks at this, and I know it's an enormous edifice, but actually, surely if this culture that you were outlining so well is actively maintained, it's not just there, it's actively maintained, difficult though it be, maybe looking at some ways in which that can be modulated, disrupted, is an important part of the strategy that we haven't talked about. Okay, uh, that's such an, that is an interesting question. Let me, was there, is there a, someone who wants to follow up on that point? Yes, the lady there at the back, if you could, um, Gemma, if you could get a, a microphone there. We'll, we'll bring, we'll come back to you, Alma. You've been robbed of your mic, but we'll, we'll give you another opportunity later. Um, yes, I had a follow up to that from earlier, actually, um, which is, I mean, there are some countries which have regulated advertising for children and the 
I mean, what are the findings there? Um, I know some of the Scandinavian countries. Um, and this, I mean, it's absolutely key. The advertising industry is playing on insecurities and desires in very manipulative, highly researched ways. Um, so government intervention in terms of regulation seems to be key. And I, this obviates, I think, as, um, as you're saying, these micro-level interventions. Um, Hal, did you want to just come back on that one I very quickly? Yeah. Media regulation, there's kind of a lot I could say. Let me try and be very con concise if I can. You saw some of the adverts which we laughed about in terms of the products, but you could kind of see the sort of sexualization, money and mismaking and unrealistic perfect body shapes and so on, which I think are actually all having the effect of increasing people's insecurities and it doesn't strike me as something that's terribly necessary. Children are very often not able to disentangle all of these messages in a very critical way. And I mean, even we are not immune. It's the drip, drip, drip effect. You look at Marilyn Monroe. I did that only a week ago. And I thought, my God, she's really quite fat. She was a sex symbol in the 1960s. Our lenses are shifting through, if you like, consumer culture advertising messages. And I do think it would be very good if we could review um, some of the images that are being put out there in terms of very unhealthy body sizes and shapes, sexualization with huge unhealthy consequences, unrealistic levels of wealth. And I think there is a real, a real kind of role for responsible advertising and governance and regulation of that. Any other? Mike, what is your view of advertising in relation to materialism? Well, clearly our business model, like all consumption-based models at the moment, uses advertising marketing heavily. I think there is, there is an end of the spectrum that you wouldn't want to be in. Size zero models, mm -hmm. uh, targeting children inappropriately for, for sugary foods, and I hope our business model doesn't have anything to do with that. Having said that, I'm not going to sit here and not pretend that consumers do want something aspirational. And I think the subtlety that we're seeing here is some of the more proactive brands, people like Unilever with their Dove brand, are starting to turn it on its head and starting to talk much more about the aspiration of being normal in life and how much you can achieve. And I think what will happen, the marketplace will decide. Some of the, some of the less responsible brands will be squeezed out. Those that are more aspirational in a new way, like, like the Dove and the, the Unilever model, will win through. But there's definitely a place for regulation at one end of the market. You would favour regulation in relation to advertising? I would be careful about it, though. So the heavy hand of the state slapped on top of the entire advertising industry? No. There are clearly one or two things that would be on the pale. We've talked, we've talked about children. Um, we've talked about, I think, size zero, is, is, again, has become a very controversial issue within the marketplace, and a number of brands have moved away with it. Some haven't. Again, the marketplace has decided, I will be cautious where I use regulation. I would intervene surgically where it can make the credit most value. Thanks, thanks. I think quick, yeah, yeah, sure, Graham. So, I mean, I mean, I think this is a really interesting point where actually there'd be quite a lot of popular support for reduced advertising. But again, we have to, I think we have to recognise that there is a certain amount of vested interest both within business and within government to reduce regulation. So we are in this really mm. contradictory situation. I think there are a lot of good businesses that would like to see some of that happen and some of those all good and some of that squeezed out. We also have to recognise there's a strong vested interest in, in not letting government, in not, not letting, but, but government not regulating. It's mm. not, so it's not quite that simple, I think. I, I mean, point taken, I mean, I've got a view, many in this room might have a, have a counter view. It goes back to my original point that we need collectively to look at individual consumption systems now. What yes. is it about the textiles industry, the food industry, which is beyond the pale and needs to be regulated out? What, have it, what is it that the marketplace will sort out itself through marketplace pressure? Where do you need voluntary agreements? We start to see it, the textiles industry with the Sustainable uh, Clothing Action Plan. And what is it where you need the intervention of taxation or, for example, research, the TSB, the good work that's been done here? There are many different levers for government to pull beyond regulation, but regulation does have its place. Okay, let's take a, another round of questions. And I'm, I promised the, the mic to Alma at the back there, and then uh, this gentleman at the front here. So if you could get a, a mic here. Alma. Yeah. Um, 
Again, we'll take two or three questions and then come okay. back to the panel. It's, it's a bit of a question and a reflection as well. Looking at materialism mm. again and uh, children, um, we've been talking about materialism making us unhappy, and I think the point to, to perhaps emphasize as well is that lack of material things can also lead to unhappiness and depression and so on, and we've seen in the video um, how the lack of any material goods can equally lead children to depression or to feeling unwell at least. So um, uh, my, my sort of thinking is uh, facing, facing children, like I'm thinking of my own daughter who is 15, and um, I think having lived in developing countries and having lived in the developed world, she has developed a very cynical view of what we do and what adults have created for them. And I don't seem to think that it's her only. I think most of her peers are very short-termist. They don't think of sustainability. They don't think of the future because they either see the, the sort of lack of opportunity, the lack of material things in developing countries, or they see the opposite here where it's all about status and how you look and what goods you have and so on. So it's, it's a bit of an open question. I, I was interested to see that you're looking at youth and different cities in the world because, um, yeah, I think it's, we need to think about what we do to overcome that cynicism and that sort of negative. Okay, so a challenge, a real challenge around um, a program looking at, at, at youth and, and youth relationship to sustainability. I, I might come back with um, some responses from an earlier study, in fact, that, that uh, UNEP did, but uh, let me bring the, the mic to the gentleman at the front here. Yeah, I just wanted to touch briefly on this um, tension around democracy. I mean, I think from a you know, council perspective, from since Agenda 21, really, there's been a kind of tension between participatory democracy, groups coming together and forming community plans, civil society involved in that process, and representative democracy at a local level, which has never been reconciled kind of by government, in, you know, kind of in my opinion. And I was a bit concerned to to hear that kind of sustainable development perhaps is in some kind of policy or is a kind of ghost policy a little bit at the moment since it is the main principle behind the planning system now um, allegedly in the national planning policy framework um, and maybe that you know there's some I mean from a local pro I mean, from a local authority perspective it would be really good to have some perhaps some clarification and expansion on that I mean you know, kind of what that concept means um, but really my point was that um, you're bound to get power imbalances where you're starting to shift power to more participatory decision making through neighborhood planning, for instance, um, where you get a self-selecting group of individuals who will formulate a plan, presumably for sustainable development for an area, and taking resources away from a council, which is a representative democracy, um, which would generally try and engage with the whole community on that process, maybe counterproductive in trying to engage those who wouldn't necessarily have the time or resources to do so um, in the whole kind of process of, of you know, well planning their communities essentially on a more sustainable basis and capturing all the aspirations of the community to engender that. Okay, a couple of points there. I mean, uh, really quite a, a sort of a challenge there. Is, is sustainability a ghost policy? And if it's a ghost policy in central government, then where does it leave local government? And then a challenge around is what, what is the perspective, really, for engaging um, children in relation to sustainability? I mean, Lee, perhaps I can uh, get you to talk first to the politics point. Yeah, I mean, I, um, well, <laughs> I don't really know what ghost policy means. Um, I think, but I, but I don't necessarily, I wouldn't feel comfortable, actually, saying that sustainable, sustainability I mean, there are two things, the sustainable development and the sustainability as well, is a ghost policy. I think that um, there's, a, there's been a period of sort of, okay, well, let's think quite carefully about what we mean when we say sustainability, and that's ongoing. And I think that that's been quite widespread for a number of years. I think that, you know, the, the area that I'm sort of, I feel comfortable saying is that, you know, we recognise that, you know, there are the three pillars of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental, and you've got to have a balancing between those. And that when you consider uh, new policies, and in particular planning policies, but whole policies right across government, there's a, a role to play in terms of establishing whether or not actually what you're doing is sustainable. 
from our perspective in, in our particular policy area, where we're looking at finite resources and things like that, part of the sustainability is, is what we're doing at the moment uh, sustainable in the sense, will we still be able to do it in that way in, in you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years' time? And when we speak to business, one of their key concerns is definitely, you know, the fact that there's significant price volatility in terms of the resources they use, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a need for sustainable policy, and I think that probably, um, you know, uh, Ian's point about, you know, you need stable policies where people know what, what is happening, what to expect, and what the regulations are going to be, or the pathway to regulation is going to be over long term, is, is entirely right. But I would say that those things feel, to me, to be quite strongly there. What that means in the future with, you know, con uh, you know uh, well, an election next year and a variety of other things, it, you know, those sorts of very specific, detailed things about, okay, well, what does that mean? Those are things are, are you know, up to change, and they are in that top line in terms of the model that was described in terms of, you know, government change was there. So, you know, there's no, but I think that those undercutting principles of sustainability are, feel still like they're still there to me quite strongly. Graham, you picked, you picked up at that point. Do you want to respond to um, that? I, I mean, actually, part of the point, your point there was also about our democratic system and I mean I, I, I'm not going to go into a long discussion here about I, I don't think there is a representative and participatory democracy are two different things I think they can they can merge and I also get a bit frustrated that participation is always something that happens on local policy on local issues I actually think we need to think about democratic innovation for sustainability and just generally for the health of our, our democracy which happens at other scales and brings citizens other social groups into new modes of governance there's all sorts of interesting experiments like participatory budgeting and, and citizens' assemblies and some of the stuff that's happening in e-democracy. I think we have to rethink the way we do things. We have to rethink the way we do things both in terms of our material consumption, but also the way we do politics. And I, I know this is a really, it's really exciting, but it's really challenging. And the level of change and disruption is, is, dis is really unsettling. Um, and I think, you know, somehow embracing unset the, the unsettling is something, is a thing that's coming out of this. Yeah. We keep saying it's the unsettling for the householder, but I think it's got to be the unsettling for the policymaker and for the businessman and for the, and for the citizen, not just the consumer. I mean, if I could just add, add to that. A lot of the success is happening in, in the world at the moment of sustainability, it's happening at city scale. It's London, it's New York, it's Copenhagen, etc. And I think that's because we're starting to find a manageable level of democracy that has got sufficient scale to do something, yeah. rather than trying to get a million small groups of two people to do something, but it's not so huge that it's the entire state. So I think the whole concept of understanding democracy at a city or regional scale, I think, again, look at the, the steps that the Welsh and the Scots have started to make in this space, is very interesting. But there is a dilemma for me, and it's a very tactical one. So we do, we're talking about the circular economy and what would enable it in the future. And we're saying, look, from a businessman's perspective, I want every local authority in the UK to collect the same waste in the same way, or recycle it. They collect the same things on the same day, the same way, sort it. There is a nice mountain of segregated stuff for entrepreneurs to reuse and, and take forward. But that cuts totally counter the concept of local democracy and local people deciding, yeah, but I actually want my waste disposal or recycling in this way. So there are tensions inherent, even if all of us desire a, a sustainable future. I don't want to forget Alma's very good question at the back, because, again, there is an elephant in the room which is consumption. There's an even bigger elephant in the room which is the developing world consumption. So we in the West now sit here feeling slightly guilty that we've <laughs> overconsumed and we've sent the planet in the wrong direction, try and tell ourselves off and find a way out of it. We're now trying to turn around to billions of other people that aspire to re come out of poverty and say, stop, guys, you know, don't do the same mistakes as us. Just stay as you are. Now, clearly, we can't do that. We have to have show people there is a way for status, for aspiration, for having a lot of the things and benefits that we have, but in a less impactful way. But the only way we'll do that is by being exemplars of what it would be, rather than we've seen some of the climate negotiations of a lecture from on far and you sort it out, it's not our problem. So I think on the, on the general level, the, the tension between the developed world and the developing, we've got to reach out and understand. I understand that this has been funded within the UK, we can't do anything about that. That's the right thing to do, but there is a much wider piece of work globally. Helga, at this point, are we, are we really just whistling in the wind in the hopes that we can influence a young generation to behave in a different way? Well, I certainly hope that is not the case, although 
having talked to the four-year-old son of my friend who said to me, you can't be cool without a PlayStation. And I said, I said, surely that has to be possible. I said, I'm cool and I don't have a PlayStation. He said, yeah, Helga, but you're old. <laughs> and I kind of, you know, I sort of feel I have a lot of arguments at my disposal. Also with children, I certainly lost on that one. So I'm not, I don't think, underestimating the challenge. But I do also think that we haven't, I mean, if we don't do, if we, if we are not successful in finding good models of change, there isn't only sustainability, or there's sustainability in terms of planetary resources. There's also sustainability in terms of people's mental and physical health. I mean, we really are looking at a reasonably serious situation, I would argue. So um, I certainly hope we can make greater progress. But if you like pulling all together and in a way trying to find models of cooperation between different people and parent power too. You can mobilize people to do a lot in terms of parent power, which is often completely underestimated. It's that pulling together, I think, on macro individual levels, on government levels, on, on business, the yeah. other structures we have. That's our only way forward. Well, I think one of the reasons why we why we always wanted to have this, this children project in there. And one, one of the reasons also why we worked with, um, with uh, Amanda Blue, it, and her work is very interesting because it, it is very much from the children's perspective. It is, it's not at all didactic. She rarely has mm -hmm. any kind of narrator view in her films, and it is mostly about children talking themselves. And one of the interesting things, actually both in the UNEP study that preceded this, and in the research that we did um, around building the, fil the, the film idea, I is that it isn't a simple black and white picture. Th there isn't a generation of kids out there who is just irredeemably materialistic, any more than there's a generation of kids out there who is irredeemably sustainable. What's, what's most interesting, actually, about what's happening in, in many of the countries in which the UNEP study looked at kids is how these different forces play together and actually how those material aspirations are certainly there and those ecological concerns are also there. And one of the most fascinating findings that we came out with in the survey, the UNEP survey that preceded the work that we're doing at the moment, and it was on a, a slightly older generation, um, 18 to 35 year olds, but it was the discovery of a, a really energized sense of social agency. What young people really did not want taken away from them was their ability to act in society in pursuit of positive change. And that was a surprising finding. It was, you know, yes, of course, we expected them to have iPhones and to want iPhones. We expected them to be concerned about climate change. We expected them to be concerned about economic security, but mm -hmm. we didn't quite expect the expression of this desire for social agency, actually a real desire for change, and that, that is, I think, um, a positive thing. And Mike. Tim, if we just extend on that, I mean, in, in the circles I move in, in the world's retail, the world's fast moving consumer goods brands, there's a mild degree of panic at the moment about the millennial consumer and employee. There's a sense that that, that individual is gonna want different things from business, but in this nuanced way. Not to say they're suddenly gonna become anti-material, um, or gonna spend the, the, the time saving the planet, but equally, nor do they want consumption as we would have known it. And there's this door or window of opportunity, I think, of the next five to 10 years to shape a different generation of consumers, but not through public information messages about consumption is bad, but by tapping into this desire to make a difference and have a purpose, mm -hmm. support them in terms of doing it, but not expect them to want to do it alone. They want to do it as part of a tribe or a group. If I can maybe just say something very briefly to that, a very interesting kind of sort of pilot piece of research about going into primary schools, looking at values and value change, but actually getting the kids involved in sustained activities of building a recycling bin, of bringing stuff in that has been used at home to make mm. something out of it. And it is that kind of social activity, very energized, very fantasyful, sustained, and endorsed by the whole peer group. I mean, it's just in a way amplifying your your, your point, the kids apparently really, really loved it. And I think it's a wonderful idea of yeah. trying to do something. Yeah. Engagement matters. Um, Graham, yeah. any final thoughts? Um, first final thought is I was actually on the commissioning panel for um, SLRG, 
and I also had the privilege of, um, of uh, reviewing results for the SRC. And it's always been a pleasure to interact with um, the people involved, involved in this, uh, with Tim, with Ian, and all the colleagues. And so first of all, I'd just like to say what a wonderful job they've done with this research. And not with the amount of money that, they, they've done more with the money than, than was expected, that's for, that's mm. for sure. Um, and as someone who's been watching it from the sidelines, I've been incredibly impressed, mostly about the relationships they've built and the networks they've built within mm. academia and actually built a capacity for us to work on this particular area. So I don't want to, I, I don't actually particularly want to make a final comment on that, I just, on, on, on what, what's happened today, but actually just to comment on the body of work, the body of research and the actual bodies um, and say, what a fantastic day this has been and it re has represented the work of SLS or SLRG and results before that. So that, that would be what I want to say. Um, Mike. Well, let's be clear. I mean, this, this has been a tremendously successful project. You've added enormously to the font of knowledge, both academically and policy making in terms of business knowledge, for which I, uh, many thanks. My second point is though, there is an elephant in the room, which is consumption. I speak for a business that I'm tremendously proud of what m has achieved with Plan A. 25% mm -hmm. systemic improvement across our business, across every product, every store, every factory, every farm, every lorry. It's the beginning, not the end. We've made our existing business model, model less bad. What you are doing is opening our eyes as to how we can make it a fundamentally more sustainable approach in the future. My final thought though, is a challenge to us all. We've got to move beyond talking. We've got to get into doing. And my challenge to all of us is to look now at specific consumption systems and say, okay, let's set ourselves the goal. In five years' time, we want to make, improve the sustainability of how food is consumed. How are we going to do it as business, as government, as researchers, as civil society as well? Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Helga. I'm just... I just, in a way, want to re-emphasize this sort of point about cooperation and networking. I think that's really the main point at which I feel we can move forward to, if you like, deal with and curb bad forms, for want of a better word, of consumption, and actually produce a society where we have consumption that is sustainable and that's also beneficial for people. Lee, how will that work in policy? <laughs> well, I mean, I'd already prepared my question. No, <laughs> you can have your final <laughs> remark. You don't have to answer that. I'm being very unfair. <laughs> Just unfair. a final, a final what comment. You always do, which is not really listen to the person who's speaking before you. But you yeah. So if you'll yeah. bear with me. I hope okay. you'll bear with me. I'll bear with you. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I just wanted to make two, two points, really. And I, unfortunately, I wasn't part of the DEFRA team who was around when this was originally commissioned. And I came from a different part of government, and I was surprised and excited when <laughs> I first heard about SPRG, SLRG, and the whole, the whole program, really. For me, the two key values have been um, the synthesis. You know, the point that Jonathan made earlier, which is, the, the whole really is much, much more than the sum of its parts. We do so much of our work in DEFRA from a, an evidence perspective in terms of we ask a question, we get a project, we get the output, and then, you know, whereas you have done a fantastic, incredible job, really, and, you know, it's been a long, I know, <laughs> it's been a long process where you've been doing this, and you've been challenging yourselves to, really, how does this all fit together, then? What's the picture? And the thing that really, really surprised me in is just how far it's gone in terms of there are some incredibly powerful and consistent messages coming out across all of the presentations today. You know, it isn't, there's so many different disciplines that have contributed and people who've brought different ideas and there's, there's still conflict there, but actually there is a real core of understanding that has emerged through this approach. And then I guess the second point, picking up on, 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 on a few of the points that have been made, is really, the value that we've got as policymakers uh, in terms of having that ongoing interaction and, and the benefits that we've sort of got, both in terms of our ability to challenge you with the sort of my so what question, what are we going to do? And there's still, I think, Zoe, who has gone off for her moment of change that was coming out of nursery, I think, but <laughs> the question of will there still be um, some questions? There clearly are still some questions, but I think that we really have, um, we, you really have done 
much more than I could have expected in terms of facing down that challenge of, so what are we going to do about it? So I'm excited about how we take that forward, and I'm very grateful to everybody for their efforts. Good. Thank you all very much. Thanks to the panel for their um, input. I mean, you know, we're all pleased that we've done a good job for you, but we're already on to the next thing, so, you know, we kind of, you know, thanks, thanks, thanks for that. It has been a tremendously productive relationship, the relationship that we've had um, with the people that we've had in DEFRA, with Jonathan, with Zoe, with Lee. Um, it, it wouldn't have been possible, any of it, without the kind of support that we've had, and in particular today would not have been possible um, without Gemma's hard work at the back there, um, uh, Barbara, who I think is downstairs, Linda, who is both communications guru and camera person and um, front desk person, um, and with all of those who have helped on the projects, including our non-academic partners, people like Peterborough Environmental Trust, who were, and I'm sure Bas will agree, were fantastic partners to have had in the project. It wouldn't have been possible for me without the support of Ian, who has been absolutely terrific in picking up the research coordination burden that's associated with a big project like this. It wouldn't have been possible for me either without the intellectual stimulation from um, those who, of you who have, have led projects. It's been, it's been a, a fantastic experience. My thanks to everybody who has spoken today. Many thanks again to you on the panel for a stimulating conversation and thank you all for coming and hearing about the hard work that we've been doing over uh, the last three years. And I look forward to inviting you back to see Amanda Blue's film where we shall have the answer to the question <laughs> about youth sustainability and cities. Um, I, I think that is a very exciting project. I think there is, there is a lot in terms of interest, in terms of research, in terms of dissemination, in terms of activism, in terms of the roles of civil society, in terms of creating the change that we all know is necessary. And I'm very excited to be going forward into that. Thank you all very much for coming.